our communities. A show where we will talk about the issues and we will try to find solutions. Your hostess, Carmen V. Holbert. Hello, welcome to our communities. Howie Hawkins, Green Party candidate for governor, is here with us. Howie Hawkins is a retired teamster from Syracuse, New York. He is a co-founder of the Green Party in the United States and has been an organizer in progressive movements, movements since the late 1960s. Thank you for accepting an interview with us. I'm glad to be here. Running as a third party candidate is not so easy in the United States. This is not your first time running for governor. What is so different this time? Well, I think the biggest difference is we're in the Trump era. And a lot of people are just saying, we got to vote against Trump. We got to get the Democrats back in. So we have a Democratic Party in the city of New York representing the landlords, pushing out the working class and the middle class by basically uh, rezoning and uh, creating a situation where rent control departments are replaced by luxury apartments. And that's called the left and the progressives. And people are so scared of Trump, they can't see straight. I think that's the challenge for us this year. We've got to, you know, reach the progressive minded people and say, wait a minute, in the fall, you're going to have the Greens on the progressive side, you're going to have the Democrats and the corporate centrist side, and the Republicans on the conservative right. And if you're a progressive, you should vote for the progressives. If you think, oh, I'll vote for the uh, Democrat on the working families line to send the Democrat a message. No, you're part of that Democratic coalition. You get lost in the sauce and you're really not distinguishing your progressive politics. So, you know, our argument to the progressives is, if you want progressive policies, vote for the progressive candidates. Now, we got 5% in 2014. We didn't win the office, but that was leverage because Cuomo wanted those votes. He wants to run for president. He wanted more votes than his daddy got, and he didn't. So he had to ask himself, why didn't I get those votes? They went to the Greens. And he looked at what we were talking about. We wanted a ban on fracking. Guess what? He decided he had to do that. $15 minimum wage. He hasn't got all the way there yet, but he moved that way. Tuition-free higher education. The Excelsior program really isn't that, but he's talking about it. And it does provide some help to some people. But if you can't afford to go full-time, you're not qualified. So it's not yet tuition-free public college, but he thought he had to move that way. And actually, I could give you 19 different issues where... He was on one side, now he's on our side, if not fully in policy, at least in the way he's talking. So that's the power of the independent vote. It gives us leverage in the political system. And my argument to progressives is vote for the left, the progressives, the Greens, and make the politicians come to you. Otherwise, you vote for the Democrat, they're just going to take your vote for granted. They won't even know it's a progressive vote. Uh, the Green Party um, platform is very progressive uh, compared to the Democrats. It's, it's just totally different. Now, what are the most pressing issues you are going to base your campaign beside housing and the other? Well, housing for sure. I mean, people are being pushed out. It's not just in New York City, it's in all the cities. And we know from a study the Comptroller did about four years ago that at that time, Uh, half the people that rent in the state pay more than 30% of their income in rent, which is the federal standard of affordability. A third of the people pay more than half their income for rent. This is statewide, and it's got worse since then. So we've got a housing crisis, and not only do we need to expand rent control, re-regulate buildings that have lost rent control, and uh, defend uh, people from displacement, we've got to expand affordable housing. And our program is instead of giving corporate welfare to developers like uh, uh, de Blasio's inclusionary zoning policy, he's giving inclusionary zoning a bad name because those in the so-called affordable have to have incomes of like $50,000 to even qualify. So that leaves a lot of people out. It's not really inclusionary. And it's more expensive to give these subsidies to developers so they can provide the affordable units than to directly build them. So we need a new public housing program. Now NYCHA needs $25 billion dollars just to get the lead paint and the mold out, get the roofs repaired, get the boilers fixed. Uh, but we got to go beyond that. We got to build public housing that's not like the old public housing that 
created low-income minority ghettos that are segregated. We want public housing, like in Europe, that's open to working class and middle class people as, very, as well as very low income people so that we begin to desegregate and they should be scatter site in the suburbs as well as the cities, humanly scaled so you can build community, uh, mixed income, and we should, they should be green. They should be powered by clean energy. They should produce more energy than they use. So that new housing program for public housing could be a jobs program a clean energy program, a desegregation program, as well as a way to create affordable housing. And you create enough public housing, that will set the standard in the market of what the real cost of providing affordable housing is. And then the rents will have to come down in the private sector. That's what, hap that's what has happened in European countries that provide a significant amount of public housing for middle, working, and poor people. And uh, it's, the rents are much more affordable there because of that. So. Housing, you asked me. So I went off on housing because it's such a big issue. Yes. Uh, Single-payer health care. We have a bill called the New York Health Act. It's passed the Assembly three times. It's one vote short in the Senate. Even Governor Cuomo said it's a good idea, but he didn't put it in the state of the state address or his budget. Mm -hmm. And right now, there's, they're about to come to the close of the legislative session. We're calling on Cuomo to use all his political capital to get the senators to vote on it. It's stuck in committee so we can go to the polls in the fall and know who's on what side. But this program would provide all medically necessary services to all New Yorkers at lower cost than we're paying now for a mix of public systems like Medicare and Medicaid and private insurance. And 98% of us would pay less. It's, pro it's funded by progressive taxation. So the top 2% would pay a little more than they now pay, but the rest of us would pay less and get better service. So that's the second issue, housing, health care, the climate crisis, we're calling for 100% clean energy by 2030 because that's what the climate science says we've got to do to avoid runaway global warming and a climate catastrophe. Uh, the best the Democrats can do is pass a bill for 100% by 2050. And that doesn't solve the problem in time. The politicians passing that won't be around for the consequences. So we're, you know, this is where the so-called progressives in the Democratic Party are not being progressive. You know, whether it's Cynthia Nixon or the assembly members that passed it, the 50, you know, 100 percent by 2050, it's not adequate. It's too late and too little. So that's that's a third big issue. And then education. Uh, the progressives are calling for more funding. That's good. And when I say progressive, the progressive Democrats. But they're avoiding the problem of high stakes testing, which is used to privatize schools because we know the high poverty schools are going to score low. And then they define them as failing. And then they take them over and hand them over to charter schools. That drains money from public school systems. Like in my city of Syracuse, half the schools are under threat of being taken over and turned into charters. You take half the schools and half the students' money, you know, that, that the state, you know, and, and the local taxes, and give them to private charter schools, uh, the public school system is going to be in a financial crisis. It's already in financial distress because the state isn't fully funding as they were supposed to under the uh, campaign for fiscal equity case. So we want to get rid of high stakes testing, stop evaluating the teachers, the schools, and the students on the basis of standardized tests, and let the evaluations of teachers and uh, the curriculums be focused to a, a well-rounded education for all the students. Every student should have access to gifted quality education like the rich kids get as well as vocational training without tracking. So you're stuck in either the vocational or the college prep. You should be able to go back and forth. I was able to do that in high school coming up. I took a lot of vocational classes. I took the college prep, got into Ivy League school. Now I got in for a variety of reasons, you know, extracurricular activities, particularly athletics. Um, and I was not standard uh, Ivy League material in English. So what did they do? They didn't say you're not qualified. They say you're the kind of student we want. And they helped me with my English. I, I took a special class for a year, and they brought me up, you know, to where I needed to be. That's what education should be about. Not, oh, you failed the test, you're flunking, we're going to turn you over some, to some charters, which is a business. You know, the uh, hedge funds are very interested in that because they lend money to the charters. They get a 39% annual discount on that loan, plus the interest. They can double their money in seven years. So this is not about education, it's about making money. That whole system which starts with high stakes testing, we've got to just stop. And finally, we have the most segregated schools 
in the nation, in New York City, in my city of Syracuse, and all the cities, uh, and in the rural areas, it's sometimes divided by class. I could give you a case of a suburban town around Syracuse where it's almost all white, but the northern half of the town is well-to-do, and they have one school district, and the working class people in the southern part of the town have a different district. They have less money, their test scores are lower, um, so we need to desegregate by class too. And uh, the way to do that is a, what they call controlled choice, where uh, you have school districts, New York has an, is big enough and diverse enough, they don't need to change the district lines. Upstate, the, the new Jim Crow lines are the district lines between poor districts and rich districts. So we need to have consolidation of districts. And then uh, parents and students can choose their schools. And that's one factor. And the other is a formula so that all the schools are diverse. They did this in Raleigh, North Carolina. And the low-income minority students' test scores increased significantly. Mm -hmm. And all the students did better on important things like intellectual self-confidence, creativity, problem-solving, teamwork, tolerance, uh, things that are important in life and in work that the standardized tests don't capture. So all the students are getting a better education when they're desegregated schools. So that's the third thing. So what have we talked about? Housing, healthcare, energy, and schools. And we, there are a lot of issues, but I would say those are the top four that really meet you know, the most pressing concerns of the people of New York. So um, you mentioned um, one of the last items uh, issues is uh, education. And uh, in my opinion, I kept repeating this, uh, the charter schools are a good way to get rid of or to undermine the teachers' union. Uh, in general, all the issues that you have mentioned, how is the labor movement responding and what is the future of the labor movement within this context? Unfortunately, the staff and officials of the unions um, have become a middle class, professional managerial class that is managing the working class, not representing them. So within the labor movement, we've got to really assert rank and file democracy and get our unions back. Because right now they're all lining up with Cuomo uh, because they're scared to death of the Republicans. It's understandable, but Cuomo's not doing them any favors. I mean, it's really disappointing to see the teachers union start to line up with Cuomo after all the attacks he's made on their unions through because he very much promoted the charters and the high stakes testing. Um, and when he first time he ran in 2010, he said uh, the teachers are standing in the way of so-called reform, by which he meant uh, testing and charters and privatization. And you know, the charter schools are mostly non-union. You got to organize them. We got a few of them organized, but uh, so it's a very anti-union position. Yet the teachers, the leadership seems to be lining up with Cuomo. Now my campaign, we're going to go to the rank and file teachers. My running mate is a teacher, GLE, and uh, last time we ran, we had the the statewide, you know, New York State Teacher United Teachers, NYSA, stayed neutral, and because of that, the AFL didn't have enough votes to give the endorsement to Cuomo. It doesn't look like they're going to do that this time. But last time we got six teachers locals to defy the state union and endorse us, so we're going back to those locals and and directly to the teachers. Because the teachers know better than the union officialdom, you know, the, how terrible the testing has been for, you know, you, you're, you're trained to be a professional teacher, and then you get this curriculum that tells you to teach to the test. It's not good education, um, and it particularly teaching to the test is imposed on the low-income students from low-income communities because they, we know, predictably are scoring low on those tests, which kind of reflect the middle-class uh, culture. So. Um, you know, that's the problem with the labor movement. There, there's the organized labor and then there's the workers and their movements. And sometimes the best organizing right now is coming from, for example, these worker centers uh, where, you know, low income workers are getting together outside the organized unions with contracts and uh, organizing actions to defend their people, whether it's their housing or their job situation or uh, defend them from ICE raids, which is a big issue in uh, I know it's something of an issue here in the city. We're within 100 miles of the Canadian border. So ICE goes, for example, to the regional transportation center where the buses and trains come in mm -hmm. and just randomly start asking people for their papers. You know, like this is some authoritarian country. And that's, that shouldn't be happening. 
And, you know, the, the farmers up there tend to be very conservative politically. They depend on those immigrant workers without documents because they're the ones that will do the work. Right. Um, so, you know, that's a case where we call for New York being a sanctuary state. We did that four years ago. Nobody was using that phrase. We put it right on our platform because we need to protect these people. And, you know, my argument to the people that think the immigrants are competing for jobs and whatnot is, look, we're aging as Americans. First of all, they're doing the work that we Americans aren't willing to do. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they pay into Social Security, and that's who's going to fund the retirement for the rest of us. So, uh, you know, we should welcome those immigrants. They're they're making a big contribution. How um, you you have mentioned um, what is happening in the border of New York State, and it's kind of similar <coughs> what is happening in New York City. Now, can you establish the difference between upstate and New York City? Well, the reality is working people and middle class people, upstate and downstate, have the same issues and the same problems. But what the politicians do is say, if they're upstate, say, oh, New York dominates the politics and they're, they're you know, everything that the state does is for New York City. And the actual fact is New York City pays more taxes and it, it's a benefit for upstate. Right. Um, on the other hand, well, on the same hand, upstate is voting on issues in New York City like rent control. Um, like there's a law the state passed about admission to these uh, elite high schools. It's just one standardized test. Mm -hmm. Why is a rural Republican legislator from, say, Wayne County, which most people in New York don't even know where that is, voting on how you admit people to high schools in New York City? They have no business doing that. Just as urban state assembly people have no business passing legislation on issues upstate. So I think uh, we got we to gotta avoid this upstate versus downstate thing because that's how they divide and conquer and working people lose out. How, what is the answer? Uh, well, I think the Green Party, you know, in the sense that we represent working people upstate and downstate, and we find our common interests, rather than playing this upstate versus downstate game. But, um, well, you would say that you are going to fight for single payer, and uh, do you think will pass this time? Uh, I don't think it'll pass this year. I'm going up to the state legislature tomorrow to lobby and try to get these senators to go on the record before the election. Um, but I think If we have a strong movement, we can force the senators to vote for it and then force Cuomo to sign it. I think that's, you know, like I said at the beginning, um, we can win reforms. We won some out of the last election, but that won't happen if the progressives voters vote for the Democrats because then they're going to be taken for granted. And Cuomo and those Democratic senators won't feel the pressure to uh, vote for the single payer. Because on the other side, they're getting money from the insurance companies mm -hmm. who don't want single payer. So right. we've got we to stay strong and vote for the ticket that's pushing for single payer without qualification. We will be there tomorrow. Now, going back to the OCT, how are you, what are your solutions for the MTA in New York City? Well, I think we know what needs to be done. The, Uh, MTA just came out with a 10-year, $39 billion dollar plan to fix the signals and the rails and the cars and the stations. The Regional Plan Association has costed it out at over $100 billion. Dollars. Um, and we need more than that to expand and improve the service to the outer boroughs that are underserved and for the upstate metropolitan areas whose public transportation is even worse than New York City's. And so that's a lot of money. So the real question is, where are we going to get the money? And there's this unproductive debate between de Blasio and Cuomo. You know, Cuomo says congestion pricing, and de Blasio says tax the rich. I say do both. Uh, congestion pricing is generally progressive because uh, it's usually the more affluent people that drive into Manhattan. It's not the working class so much. They use the trains and the buses. Um, but we also need to tax the very wealthy. They've made a lot of money, particularly from real estate and the financial sector down here. 
In 1980, the top 1% in the city got 12% of all the income in the city. By 2014, a few years ago, the top 1% got 39% of all the income in the city, from 12% to 39%, but their taxes have been cut. So we need to bring the income tax, make it more progressive like it was in the 1970s. And then we have a stock transfer tax that's about $15 billion a year. The state collects it and gives it right back to the stock traders on Wall Street. Mm. If we kept that, we'd have $15 billion we can invest in housing and a transportation and other infrastructure, public housing. If we had the kind of progressive tax structure we had in the 1970s on income, we'd have another $10 billion. There's $25 billion a year. And it's a multi-year process to spend $100 billion on the subways and $25 billion on housing just to get them up to grade and more to expand both housing and transportation, but the money's there. And uh, congestion pricing is about a billion dollars a year. Um, that's good because it incentivizes people to use public transportation instead of drive their car in, um, which reduces traffic, has a lot of benefits, but it's only a billion a year. The Daily News just had an editorial saying, the rich will move away if we tax them, so go with congestion pricing, and that's enough. No, that's only a billion a year. And the MTA just said 39 billion over 10 years. So where's the rest of this money coming from? I'm afraid they're gonna borrow it. And the problem is the MTA has become an ATM for Wall Street. Mm -hmm. So they borrow the money, interest payments become a bigger and bigger part of the MTA's budget, and Wall Street gets rich, and then the taxpayers have to pay for it anyway. It's better to tax the rich up front than to borrow from them and then add interest on top of it. So progressive taxation, I think, is, is you know, what we really got to focus on, and then we'll have the money for all these investments um, in the areas we've been talking about, education, housing, transportation, energy to build out the clean energy system. Although in healthcare, because single payer is more efficient, it's actually going to save the state and the people of the state a lot of money. And with those savings, we can invest it in other infrastructure. We've, um, in the last uh, year, something came up with the home attendance in the healthcare system of that uh, they were uh, kind of forced to work 24 hours and only get paid 13. How do you uh, address that problem? You know, the fact that these scared progressives, scared of Trump, want to back somebody like Cuomo as a lesser evil or at least anti-Trump, when he does things like his Department of Labor did, those home attendants won a court case, second appellate division, saying they have to be paid for the 24 hours on those shifts. Now, there shouldn't be 24-hour shifts in the first place. But if you're going to be on a 24-hour shift, you should be paid for all the hours. Uh, and what the uh, state, or the I guess they, the, who was sued were the agencies, they're appealing. So while the appeal's going on, the State Department of Labor said, uh, we're going to keep it the way it is. You only get paid 13 of your 24 hours, which is, uh, you know, unpaid labor is slavery. And this is what we're getting from the Cuomo administration. Um, and why progressives can't see how that's not progressive is, uh, you know, the problem for our campaign. We got to make them see things like that. Um, and it's, you know, home health care workers, it's farm workers who don't have the protections of the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, the right to days off, overtime pay, minimum wage. They've got nothing. They're very exploited. And uh, this is a governor who's getting all the unions backing them. It's, uh, it's a shame on the unions. It's a shame on progressives that don't rebel that this is what they're voting for when they vote for Democrats. Um, so there are a lot of issues in terms of, you know, what's happening to working class people that, uh, you know, we need a new direction. So we're ready for a third party? Uh, I think if you look at the public polling on the positions we hold, you know, single-payer health care, uh, a public job guarantee, so if you can't get a job in the private sector, you can go to the employment office instead of the unemployment office and say, I want my job, and it's funded doing things that local communities define are needed, whether it's public services or public works, infrastructure. Uh, that All these things poll 60% or more in favor. Um, and, you know, the real problem of American politics and New York politics is public opinion doesn't translate into public policy. We've got this two-party system of corporate rule, and the Democrats are very much important to that because they 
sort of provide a progressive face and it gives the illusion of choice. Well, when the election's over, you look and see who funded Trump and who funded Cuomo. You know, remember Scaramucci, the mooch they mm -hmm. called him, that was a spokesperson for Trump for a while? Yeah. yeah, he was head of Republicans for Cuomo in 2010. Carl Icahn was in the Trump administration as an advisor and a big funder, big funder for uh, Mario Cuomo. A lot of these real estate people that are Trump's peers in New York State, uh, New York City real estate, gave to both Cuomo and Trump. Yeah. Um, so the funders do. And then you look at the, uh, the top dogs in the Democratic Party. There's a guy upstate who just got uh, pleaded guilty to bribing uh, Andrew Cuomo's brother from another mother, Joe Prococo, mm -hmm. his right-hand man, to uh, grease the wheels so a power plant called Competitive Power Ventures in Orange County could go forward. This is a terrible idea. It uses fracked gas and uh, would add 10% uh, more to the carbon footprint of the state and contribute to global warming. So it shouldn't be built for that reason. But the man who made the bribes, his name is Peter Galbraith Kelly Jr. He, is the national, he was treasurer for the Democratic National Committee. Uh, he's in a public relations firm with Charlie Black, a big Republican uh, public relations and lobbying guy. And Peter Galbraith Kelly Sr., Junior's father, was in the same firm with Charlie Black back in the 80s, along with Paul Manafort, mm -hmm. Roger Stone, Lee Atwater. So, and, and their clients were people like uh, the dictator of Zaire, Mobutu, the dictator of the Philippines, Marcos, Senator Jesse Helms from North Carolina, a racist senator that uh, created havoc in the Senate for years. Uh, and so you have the Democrat, top dog Democrats, and these top dog Republicans lobbying on behalf of the worst dictators and corporations and politicians. So that's how the, it's a two-party system. And in the elections, they give you the choice, but after the election's over, they take care of business for themselves and their clients. And that's what people got to see, that, uh, that neither of those two parties benefits them, and that's why we need a third party. Well, thank you so much for your time and the valuable advice for the voters in these elections. Thank well, you. thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Our Communities, a show where we will talk about the issues and we will try to find solutions. Your hostess, Carmen V. Holbert. On Wednesdays at 8 o'clock on OccupyRadio.net.